like to uh, start off by giving them just a little bit of history of uh, Scott County and how it came into being and, and uh, where we are and, and maybe where we're going. And most of all, we're going to do a lot of history. And uh, we're going to try not to make it too boring for you. And uh, I think you uh, may enjoy it. But uh, back in 1750, uh, an explorer, his name was Thomas Walker. Uh, he uh, went outside the boundary of uh, what was the uh, uh, to become the original 13 colonies, and of course he went west. And uh, when he did, well, he came upon uh, the Cumberland River, and uh, he named the Cumberland River after Prince William, who was uh, the son of King George II of England. And uh, later on. Uh, other explorers followed his footsteps. Now, uh, the uh, Transylvania Company, uh, they hired a man by the name of Daniel Boone to uh, widen out an Indian path that uh, became known as the uh, Wilderness Road, and that came through Cumberland Gap, of course. Now, uh, the people that uh, followed Boone and uh, others through the area they mainly uh, went on down the valley and uh, went across the state and uh, toward the more fertile lands out in the middle and west Tennessee. Uh, nobody set out to just uh, make uh, Scott County their home during that area or during that time period. Uh, the people that probably settled Scott County uh, migrated here from uh, places like Ohio and, and uh, Kentucky, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, there was uh, later on a lot of Irish, uh, some Scotch, and German ancestry in our area. Uh, and there's a, a few others, uh, Italian, uh, Swiss, and so forth. But uh, yeah, mainly uh, we're all uh, what they call Scotch-Irish. Our roots uh, stem from North Carolina. Now, North Carolina stretched all the way from uh, the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. And, uh, of course, there was a, a lot of difference in uh, politics because uh, you get people in one area uh, don't exactly agree with uh, the town people or the other people on the other side of the ridge. So, uh, there became a state it was called the state of Franklin. Now, uh, Scott County was not in the state of Franklin. That was uh, on over in East Tennessee. Uh, but now, later on down the line, uh, Scott County was among a group they called the Nickajacks. Uh, the Nickajack people were the uh, people who did not own slaves. Uh, they voted uh, when it came up for secession from the Union. Uh, they voted to stay in the Union, and uh, Scott County was uh, among the real strong supporters of uh, staying with the Union. And uh, even later on, uh, after Tennessee did secede from the Union, uh, Scott County decided to secede from Tennessee, and uh, they didn't even ask for readmission until the 1980s. So. Uh, we have a, a pretty independent mind here in Scott County. Back in the early 1800s, uh, Scott County was uh, a part of Fentress County. It was a part of Morgan County. It was a part of uh, Campbell County, maybe even a little bit of Anderson County. And the uh, this General Assembly uh, saw fit because, uh, again, there was greater distances and uh, people having a hard time getting to their county seat from uh, across the river and so forth. Uh, the Tennessee uh, Assembly uh, carved Scott County out of those counties. And in uh, 1849, Scott County uh, became a county upon its own and uh, Huntsville was uh, uh, decided upon to be the county seat. Uh, in the early days of the county, uh, Oneida was uh, not even a town. As a matter of fact, uh, there's some maps that uh, I've been looking at that don't even have Oneida on the map. 
uh, after the Southern Railroad came through, uh, it was not the Southern back then, it was the Cincinnati Southern. And uh, they built the railroad in the 1880s. Uh, Oneida became uh, one of the shipping points and, uh, for the uh, Cincinnati Southern. And uh, from there, uh, Oneida began to grow. Uh, the bigger towns in, at that time were uh, uh, towns like New River, uh, North Norma, there was a big settlement. Buffalo had a big settlement. Uh, there was uh, not a lot of people in Oneida proper. As a result of the Southern Railroad uh, coming through the area, uh, there was a need for uh, a way to transport uh, timber and coal, which uh, was beginning to open up. And uh, there were several spur lines uh, that came off the railroad tracks, and they went up uh, the Tennessee Railroad. Uh, and there was the uh, O and W Railroad a little later on, and uh, of course uh, there was uh, a railroad uh, line that went up to Brimstone. And uh, we're going to start our program off uh, talking a little bit first about the Tennessee Railroad, and. Uh, We've got a, uh, a man here that uh, has been a Scott Countyan practically all his life. And he uh, lived up north for a while, and even though he lived up north, while uh, every chance he got, he uh, came to Scott County because it's the place he loves. And, uh, back at the, oh, in the fifties, uh, sixties, they said. Uh, on Friday night, they closed up Cincinnati and some of those other towns because everybody left town to go back home to Tennessee. And a lot of people had to go up there and find work during that area, but before that time, there was the, the Tennessee Railroad. We're going to talk mainly about in the 30s. And so, uh, without uh, any further ado, let's, let's give a listen to Tommy Chan. is my name I live on Mount Farm down in Tennessee I sold fortune and fame Whippoorwills Whippoorwills Crickets and the butterflies A meadow of green and tall, tall trees A starry southern Stanley Junction was uh, just a, for a few miles out of Oneida. It was uh, there's a mountain there, and they got a tunnel. They called it Tunnel Hill, and uh, they would come down the river with 80 or 90 cars. But they, when they got down there to Stanley Junction, they had a sidetrack, and they would turn it off, pull the cars off, and then they had a, a big engine would meet them, and they would double head across the mountain, and then that engine worked all night. 
my dad run that engine quite a bit. We called it the hill engine, and uh, hauling them, they could haul maybe seven or eight cars across that mountain. And uh, they'd work all night bringing the cars over to night. It, it wasn't very many miles over there. It didn't take long to make a trail. And uh, I would go down to the railroad and take my dad's lunch around dark. And my uncle, my dad's family was all railroad people. He had three or four brothers, and they all worked for the railroad, especially the two that I remember most was John and Fred. Fred was a mechanic, and he worked on the engines at night. And my, but after my brother, or Uncle John, died, my dad, he, he got John's whistle off the train. They, those engineers had their own whistles that they would blow and blow different tunes on, and uh, Frank, he worked on the section a lot, but they all worked on the railroad, and I would go down at night to the depot and uh, where they pulled the train in there, and uh, Fred, I'd ride around with him. He would switch them and work on them, and I would take my dad's lunch down to him, and uh, he would work all night on that hill engine, bringing that coal across the mountain. They brought that train up there to Stanley Junction and they couldn't pull it all across that hill. Uh, how many did they take across the hill at a time? They did take, uh, I don't know, the little engine that brought them down the valley didn't hardly ever go across there. They double head with that big engine and they could only take seven or twelve or something. I don't know exact, but there wasn't many. They'd pull them across that mountain the first time, then they would go back and start hauling the coal all night long, and I think it was six or seven cars they would bring across the mountain. I wonder, I wonder why, uh, you know, uh, a big locomotive like that couldn't pull it across Tunnel Hill. Well, those tracks are slick, and them wheels, all they do is just spin out if they even when they'd start sometimes, you'd hear them tires, they would back them trains up, and then you'd hear them tires them cars would click and click, 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 and they would get a, that would give them a start, and uh, they just, they had sand on them, and they'd have to sand those uh, tracks underneath that car, their train, and uh, they just. It's too it, slick to, for too slick. traction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I understand that. I thought it had something to do with the amount of uh, weight that it could pull across that hill, or more or less, but it, it was weight, but it was yeah. uh, with the traction of the tracks too. Yeah, that was probably, and that was the same thing with stopping them. It took a long way to stop a train because when they, they call it swiping the gauge, they would only do that if there was a person on the track. If it's animals, horses, cows, they'd rather pay for the horse than to uh, have to put new rims on them wheels. It cost thousands of dollars. What would but, it do, make them flat or something? Yeah, it would flatten them out oh. if they slid them on the track. Yeah. Well, I understand. Now, how, uh, did you ever ride the train? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I didn't like to ride in the engine much because the, the car, they hauled the water and the coal and the engine was separate and when they would go, one of them would sway one way and one the other and I was always thinking they was going to jump the track <laughs> on me. But I loved to ride the caboose. They'd take me up in the couple of them, uh, cupola, those people, the conductors would, and uh, I'd just sit up there, and then they had a passenger train, and when we lived at Normandy, I'd ride the old Nighty all the time when we come out. We could ride free anywhere in the United States. We could get a pass to ride if your dad or your family worked, if somebody worked on the railroad. and. Uh, I rode the train quite a bit. I rode the first time I went to Michigan. I rode a passenger train to Michigan. For free? Free. Yeah. Well, that'd be all right. I'd say it costs thousands of dollars now to get to take one of those scenic train rides. Yeah, it would take, uh, I think it's $14 to get a bus ticket back then, but I don't know what the train. But I also rode uh, one of them Pullman train from Knoxville to Nashville and back to South Carolina when I went in the Marines. 
And I thought that was quite something. They had those things they called berths. They would fold the seats down and make a bed, and they'd put the doors in. You had a little room with a bed in it, and they had a dining room. And uh, they hauled us from Knoxville to Nashville, and we stayed all night down there, and then we went back to Paris Island, South Carolina on that train. And uh, I never did ride one of them anywhere. I always thought about taking my family and going on a trip maybe to California or somewhere where they had the dining cars and all that, but we never did do that. Yeah. Well, uh, now how far up the, the line have, uh, what's the farthest up the line you ever rode the train? All the way or? Yeah, I'm, I've been uh, to the end of it with. Now was uh, that at Fort, Fort Mountain? Well, Everett, I guess so. I'm not sure. Livonia? I, I, yeah, it was up there, but I was young and I didn't pay any attention to the name of the town, but there's all of them towns up there, or Coal Camp, Fort Mountain Beach Fort, all of them, and uh, I get them mixed up a little bit. I don't know exactly the location, anything from Smoky Junction to Old 90, I know where they're at, but I don't know where they're on further up. But, uh, I know where they're at, but I don't know which what their name, which was called what. Uh, did you ever help uh, shovel coal in the in the engine or uh, put the water in it? Or? No, that's kind of strange. There was not one of us boys. I had three brothers and there's not any of us ever went to work for the railroad. We all went out and worked at the factories and coal mines and equipment, and heavy equipment, and different things, but none of us ever worked on the railroad. Well, I, I thought that was a tra uh, family uh, tradition, you know, that was passed down from father to son. Well, it went through the brothers of my dad, but it never got into our family. Oh, okay. All right. When I was uh, probably four or five years old, I think for sure we moved up to Normandy during the Depression. I was in a, I started at school at Bill Branch. I was in what they call the Primer. Then they didn't have head start and all that. And uh, my dad, he always had to blow the whistle on that train. He'd come up that river blowing that whistle. He could blow tunes. He'd blow Oh How I Love Jesus and others tunes. And uh, the older people, they're most of them dead now, but they, when I came back a few years ago, they would say, I'd tell my Joe Chambers, his son, and they would tell me, Oh, we love to hear him blow that whistle. Those engineers would change their whistle when they get a different, they get on a different run. And I can remember a little boy down there in that school, and I'd hear him go up that valley blowing that whistle. And sometimes I missed him so bad I'd cry. I wanted to see my dad. Of course, I was five or six years old, and uh, I'd always look forward to him coming home on the weekend. And yeah. You know, We'd sit and listen to the Grand Ole Opera and sometimes we'd have to take water out and pour it on the ground rod to get the old static out of the radio. But uh, there was only a station or two that you could get. We'd sit and listen to the Grand Ole Opera together and I always enjoyed him coming home. And We had hogs and he'd look at them and tell me what, how to feed them and what to do to them for them. And, uh, I always was glad when we got to move to Oneida where we could live together. During the Depression, we moved to Norma to a little farm up there because there was no work nowhere. And uh, my dad would get one or two days a month and he would come back to Oneida and stay with his sister. And uh, we had a little farm and we raised most of the stuff we eat there. Had a cow, and raised a couple of hogs, and uh, we raised potatoes and everything that we eat. But then, when, like when the fair would be at Oneida, we'd go over to Norma and catch a passenger train and we'd ride to Old 90 and stay with my grandpa Chambers a week and some of the kids said we was like Santa Claus we only come once a week <laughs> or a year once a year out yeah. there <laughs> and uh, we'd come and that was a vacation we that was a long journey for us to go on a vacation for a week in Old 90 at that time yeah. and then in the 40 we moved back to Old 90 and that's when I would go down to the railroad and take my dad's lunch and stuff. I remember more about the railroad there 
in the forties than I did when we lived in Normandy. Before the war happened, they was that train that went into Normandy went on up into Livonia or to the head of the river we called it. They was three or four trains a, a day went up there and they was a passenger train and they had a couple of passenger cars and they brought all the freight to we had a depot in Norman and we ordered a chicken from Sear and Roebuck or a Beagle Hound or a bicycle. Well we didn't buy many bicycles back then, but anything you bought I can remember when we got our first radio, it came in on to the depot over there and we had to pick it up. It had three big batteries with it. And uh, everything was sh shipped, was on railroad back then. There was no semi trucks hauling anything. Or, and the mailman we had rode a horse. And if he could bring Sears and Roebuck catalogs and all that stuff, but if there was anything big, we had to go to Normandy to the post office and pick it up. And uh, that's as the war started and work picked up, the train kind of kept going downhill. They, wasn't, they needed many. They didn't haul as much stuff. And they finally tore the depot down. But they were stopped from Stanley Creek to, uh, where's that new town? Yeah, new town. New Town. I think they call that River Junction. Yeah, they call that River Junction. We call it New Town, and, but it goes to Cordale and then Winona and then Cordale and then Bull Creek and Normie and Montgomery and Smoky Junction. Every little village up through there had a, a train stop or a depot or a, just a little post office and they'd bring the mail and drop it off. The post office picked the mail up at the, had a person they were right close by, and they'd walk out and pick up the bag of mail. Or if there was a depot like in Normandy, they would set it off on it. They had a dock built there, but right by where the train pulled up, and they'd uh, they'd pick that mail up and sort it, and then you'd go to the post office. A guy by the name of Luther Pennington had one there in Normandy. Luther was big in the coal company, the coal back at that time, and. Uh, Luther always had mines everywhere, but he owned a post office and saw mills and stuff. And they would pick that mail up and take it to their post office. Then you'd go there and pick up your mail. But the, the mailman we had out in the country, we lived about two or three miles away from there. He'd come by on a horse every afternoon delivering mail. Mm -hmm.